All right. Welcome to everybody who has already chimed in. They're in the room waiting for me. I've had several delays today, but this is the first filming of History Connected. And this is where we take the things that we learn in our research online that hyper learning, the hyper learning is a function of meta learning. The meta learning is how to learn anything. And then the hyper learning is applying that to the interwebs. And then you have all this information and you don't know how to organize it. So there's a variety of ways to do so. Um, some people use Evernote. I find the, the particular way that I use for research that's very effective and that I've continued to use and that, that consistency is part of the importance in a tool is a tool, it's a piece of software called The Brain and it's found at thebrain.com. It's been out there for maybe 20 years. I've used it since 2003. The model that we're gonna be looking at tonight, I have built since 2008. And in fact, when I was looking back at the 2008 version, I think it probably does go back further than that, but um, I would have to do more research. Anyway, 11 years in production, this current model that we're gonna be looking at tonight. And the book that I'm gonna start off with is Technopoly. Technopoly. I don't have the desk cam in here, the book cam for this studio hooked up. I did try to hook it up and I thought, you know what? Delaying this episode any further today runs into other people's presentations and other things going on in, in uh, the Autonomy Dojo. So I'm just showing you the book. We'll cover it in the other studio, in the library studio on Smart Reads next Wednesday. So this is a foreshadowing. So before we get to the quotes from the book next week, today we're going to learn about the author, what other books has he written, these sort of things. And then the other aspect was, while I was in there uh, looking for this book, I found The Technological Society by Jacques Ellul. I found Techno uh, Technocracy Rising by Patrick Wood. I also found The Laws of Media, The New Science by Marshall McLuhan. And McLuhan actually ties in with tonight's author, Neil Postman. And so we'll get to that uh, eventually when we do the basic grammar, the general grammar on who is Neil Postman. Uh, why did he write this book? Did he write other things before this book that we should know about these sort of things? And then we'll get into uh, the logic uh, next week when we cover it in smart reads. That's uh, the actual quotes and how they fit together and what contradictions they might illustrate about our current society and our dependency on technology in ways that are liabilities instead of our leveraging of technology in ways that are assets. So um, I got a couple new screens. Let me see if this will uh, translate for you guys until I do that. All right, so now you guys should be able to see uh, the Wikipedia on the left, brain model on the right. And I think there's one other button I made, but I don't see it right away. So at least we have the two buttons we need. We have me full screen. <laughs> And then uh, you guys will be able to see my computer screen or at least one of my monitors that I cramped two items onto. So Wikipedia, the reference source, uh, will be on the left. The history blueprint built with the brain model will be on the right. I will be in the bottom of the screen if all works out well. Hopefully I don't block any useful information. And then as I kind of scroll and navigate adding something new to my model, I want to start out with something very simple, rudimentary. Uh, so it's not confusing because a lot of these other books get into topics right away that are very dense and uh, they're for future episodes. So uh, keeping it simple, uh, minimum viable product, minimum viable audience, we're able to make uh, a little progress moving forward and then we'll gain uh, consistency by doing these every other week. Uh, me having a weekly slot so I can produce and have interactive questions and answers. Speaking of which, those of you who are here today uh, and want to participate, you feel, uh, feel free to ask questions, interrupt me, interject, offer value, do what you do naturally. Uh, that's all part of this format. And um, yeah, so for now, let me change over so, uh, to the view so we can see uh, what's on screen. Start consuming some of the uh, just basic information about a man who lived for a long time, did a lot of things, but this is a, a starting point. So hold on one second. First off, anyone who would critique my use of Wikipedia here, let's just talk about it. The internet, if you do a search, which is what I did uh, to get to this page on Neil Postman, there's a lot of different articles out there. You could read articles from the newspaper. You could read articles from a university. Uh, you could go out there and do all that clicking, open all those tabs, read all those articles. However, the purpose of Wikipedia, it being wiki, it's supposed to be easy. So it's supposed to amalgamate and bring forth all these good resources on the web present them in a scholarly type of article. I'm not saying it is scholarly. I'm just saying they're giving you the general information as a traditional encyclopedia might. And at the bottom, you have the all important uh, references. 
There are footnotes through each Wikipedia article. If you read something in a Wikipedia article and there's not a footnote or a reference, I would not enter that as fact in my brain. I would hold off. I'd say that is a claim, but I haven't seen evidence to substantiate that. And that's the way I consume uh, a Wikipedia page. So starting over here on the left side, Neil Postman, they always have the name at the top. This is the format. Uh, they give the dates in which he lived. When his case, it was March 8th, 1931 to October 5th, 2003. Neil Postman was an American author, educator, media theorist, and cultural critic who is best known for his 20 books. And there's a list at the bottom of those books. Footnote number one. Uh, including Amusing Ourselves to Death, 1985, Conscientious Objections, 1988, Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture to Technology, 1992, The Disappearance of Childhood, 1994, and The End of Education, Redefining the Value of School, 1995. Very interesting works, bookending a long career, uh, sharing useful information with other people. He was born in New York City. He died in 2003, age 72, in New York City. Um, it goes through the, the general bio, so usually I would read through that. I would uh, not take up so much time, except there is a term here, media ecology theory. And so when you come across a term in a Wikipedia article, the idea is not to skip over it. So if I were adding this into a model, which we will do in a second, uh, I would want to right click and open that tab, which I have already done when I was setting up the studio today, media ecology. So we're going to need to read that. And then I've also gone through and clicked open his books because we might need to know a little bit of something about each of those books in order to make uh, a model of understanding that we are gaining as we gain it. So uh, the other notable aspect, uh, one of the places he was educated was at Teachers College, Columbia University. He was awarded a master's degree in 1955 and an ed D, a doctor of education degree in 1958. So he's well, uh, well versed in the establishment's view. He was groomed by the establishment. Uh, this media ecology program that uh, he founded, a graduate program in media ecology, that seems to be important. We're going to take a look at that in a second, but let's go through and continue to consume. Uh, again, if you were doing this in real time for yourself, you would actually read through these parts. I'm just trying to draw out some of the value that is gained because there's a lot of other things we have to do in this meeting besides cover the, uh, the basics. So once you scroll down, they do have subsections on his books. So I'll just read the subsection for you. Amusing Ourselves to Death. One of Postman's most influential works is Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. In Amusing, Postman argued that by expressing ideas through visual imagery, television reduces politics, news, history, and other serious topics to entertainment. He worried that culture would define or decline if people became an audience in their public business, a vaudeville act. Postman also argued that television is destroying the serious and rational public conversation that was sustained for centuries by the printing press. Technopoly. That's the book we're going to cover today. In his 1992 book, Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture, to technology, Postman defines technopoly as a society which believes, quote, the primary, if not only, goal of human labor and thought is efficiency, that technical calculation is in all respects superior to human judgment, and that the affairs of citizens are best guided and conducted by experts, end quote. You might notice that has a similar theme to last week's Smart Reads, which was Edward Bernays' propaganda, which said that the executive arm of the invisible government is propaganda. How is that applied? It's applied through technology. So there will be an intertwining between Smart Reads in the library studio and the History Connected show in here. It won't always be about the same books that are covered, but there are layers and interconnections between these concepts because these guys all knew each other. And that's not the evidence. The evidence is in their work. But when you study uh, Marshall McLuhan and you start to learn about uh, Neil Postman and his work in media ecology, you start to see uh, reality on a finer scale. It takes, them, takes some reading, though. Let's see. Uh, in an interview, Postman described technopoly as being about the tendency of technology to be given cultural control of sovereign American social institutions. Hmm. 
Wonder what he would have thought about Facebook. Postman argues that the United States is the only country to have developed into a technopoly. He claims that the U.S. has been inundated with technophiles who do not see the downside of technology. This is dangerous because technophiles want more technology and thus more information. However, according to Postman, it is possible for a technological innovation to have, I'm sorry, according to Postman, it is impossible for a technological innovation to have on only a one-sided effect. With the ever-increasing amount of information available, Postman argues that, quote, information has become a form of garbage, not only incapable of answering the most fundamental human questions, but barely useful in providing coherent direction to the solution of even mundane problems, end quote. Postman was not opposed to all forms of technology. In page seven of Technopoly, he argues that technological advancements, specifically, quote, the telephone, ocean liners, and the reign of hygiene, end quote, have lengthened and improved, <laughs> improved modern life. In his words, this agreement proves that he is not a, quote, one-eyed technophobe, end quote. In Technopoly, Postman discusses Luddism, explaining that being a Luddite is often associated with a naive opposition to technology. But according to Postman, historical Luddites were trying to preserve their way of life and rights given to them prior to the advancement of new technologies. I see they don't cover his books on education of the school system. That's one of the shortcomings of Wikipedia. So you know they exist. They're not represented in this article. They might be worth searching out uh, in a future episode. Selected bibliography. They do list his books. They do have an end of education open and new tab right there. We could see and we could read about it. It's just not covered in the article. It has a whole page. But they don't refer to the fact that it has a whole page until they get to the selected bibliography. So sometimes you got to look at these things. And the ones that interest me are all these ones that have links attached to them. Technopoly, the surrender of culture to technology, 1992. It's like a long time before Facebook and internet surveillance and all these things that we're experiencing today uh, in the early 21st century. Was he a prophet? Was he a soothsayer? Was he someone who read their business plans and said, oh, if they continue doing this, these are going to be the problems? I think it's probably that option. All right, so now uh, we've got his books up. Let me switch media ecology over here. Got the end of education, amusing ourselves to death, technopoly, uh, end of education. I already had that open. So let's close that one. Let's go to media ecology for a second. Before we start adding them to the model, let's just read a little bit more about what he was about so we can have some understanding when we start to model what we're learning. And that's part of how we form our understanding. Media ecology. Media ecology theory is the study of media, technology, and communication, and how they affect human environments. The theoretical concepts were proposed. Sorry, the theoretical concepts were proposed by Marshall McLuhan in 1964. While the term media ecology was first formally introduced by Marshall McLuhan in 1962. Ecology in this context refers to the environment in which the medium is used, what they are now, and how they affect society. Neil Postman states, quote, If in biology a medium is something in which a bacteria culture grows, as in a petri dish, in media ecology, the medium is a technology within which a human culture grows, end quote. In other words, quote, Media ecology looks into the matter of how media of communication, uh, how media of communication affect human perception, understanding, feeling, and value, and how our interaction with media facilitates or impedes our chances of survival. The word media ecology, I'm sorry, the word ecology implies the study of environments, their structure, content, and impact on people. An environment is, after all a complex message system which imposes on human beings certain ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving. There's an interesting footnote six. Maybe we'll check that out at the bottom of the page. Media ecology argues that media act. I'm sorry. I always get thrown off as uh, media being the plural of mediums, right? So 
Media ecology argues that media act as extensions of the human senses in each era, uh, and communication technology is the primary cause of social change. McLuhan is famous for coining the phrase, quote, the medium is the message, end quote, which is an often debated phrase believed to mean that the medium chosen to replay a message is just as important, if not more so, than the message itself. McLuhan proposed that media influence the progression of a society and that significant periods of time and growth can be categorized by the rise of a specific technology during that period. Additionally, scholars have compared media broadly to a system of infrastructure that connect nature and a culture of society with media ecology being the study of the traffic, the connections between the two. All right, so now we know a little bit about media ecology, that Postman uh, helped to create a master's uh, level class in that, that he was influenced by Marshall McLuhan. Interesting character. So Marshall McLuhan, I have in the history blueprint, and we're going to say, we're going to start over here. We're going to drag off to the left, and we're going to add a guy named Neil Postman. Now, if Neil's in here, he should pop up, but he's not. So I can add him as a new guy. Neil Postman, author. Now, if you notice, I'm going to click on that thought. He's going to go to the center of the screen, and we got nothing. We got nothing. So let's talk about this for a second. All right. So starting with uh, your own blank personal brain model. So the, the software is free. Anybody can download it. Anybody can do their own model for their business, their ideas, uh, organize their life. There's a whole bunch of different things you can use the software for. So by learning uh, about uh, Neil Postman and how I'm going to enter this into my model for my context, for my research use, think of other ways that you might be able to use that software in your life and, you know, uh, try your own model. So when you open it up and you have a brand new model, it's very intimidating because there's nothing in there. And then you feel a real responsibility. If you're trying to model something you think you know about, uh, take like how the government works or something like that, you're immediately going to start to identify, I don't really know that much about that. And the learning will then engage. So what you're doing by putting something in a brain model is you're asking and answering questions in order to build it. That process of thinking is what we use for learning, but the process of doing it is, makes it shareable, makes it instantly recallable for you as a tool. You can also share it with other people more easily. So some of your research that you feel like you did a lot of research, but you don't have a real tangible grasp or, or, or handles on it to be able to show somebody else and take them through the same line of thinking that you went through, now you do. So you have that opportunity. So I'm going to jump back to uh, actually building out the model, but I just wanted to say, this is not just to research about this book. This is not just to see about how I do it or what's my process. This is enabling you to leverage a very useful free piece of software that they do have a paid version, but you likely would never use the features that requ like require getting a real license for it, right? So uh, use it to your advantage. You might see other people using it now because uh, you know about it. It's on your radar and you'll be around some other people that are probably using this uh, to run their business or to embolden their life. There we go. All right, cool. All right, so Neil Postman is now in the center of the screen. Let's go back to his Wikipedia page because that's the quickest way to get something done. Now, the way I do this is we want to add an attachment. So Neil Postman, author, that's the central thought. I could change his name right here. I could add labels, tags, all sorts of stuff. I could change the color of it. I could add a picture. I don't do any of that. It's too much too much minutia, not enough result. What is useful is you grab the edge of the URL right here and you drag it over and now that's an attachment. So now Neil Postman, it plugs in live to the internet. You can scroll it. Watch, I'll click right here. We can scroll. You can click these links. They'll open up. Uh, it's very useful. I can also go back and write in personal notes and oftentimes I do. So a lot of times in my model, I'll have personal notes or quotes that I've pasted with references, anything useful, I store it right there. And then I have whatever the internet website. If this was a YouTube video, I would drag the YouTube video. In fact, let's do that for a second because this is something useful. A lot of times if I watch like uh, one of James Corbett's series, I will watch it and then add things to the history blueprint. So if you search Corbett in my model, you would see a lot of his videos. And then off to the side, uh, look at this. Somebody was watching on my computer here. <laughs> Neil Postman, amusing ourselves to death. 
All right, so now we got this uh, college lecture series or Neil Postman, <clears throat> amusing ourselves to death. Here's, uh, no, that's not a good one. Let's go back here to the college one. So he's got this lecture series, right? We have and a real treat for you. I wanted to, uh, let's say we are watching that. We could just drag that in over here. It has Neil Postman as the presenter. So he produced a college lecture series. You could change his title and you could just do like this. Control C, click that. Now, technically, I would probably, because it's not a formal publication, like a book, so I'd probably put this off to the side, right? Now, also, while he's talking in here, he might talk about cybernetics. So I would type in cybernetics, and then I could uh, have a very selection, and I would click that, and it would start to model out that video, right? Uh, let's do Control-Z, get rid of that. So let's go back to Neil Postman, the author. All right, so... Um, he has an influence from Marshall McLuhan. You might even say that influence is top down because McLuhan's older. He was setting the precedent. Neil Postman had new observations and built upon that philosophy. Over here, you've got peripheral data, things that are about Neil Postman, like uh, uh, let's see if he's uh, New York Times. New York Times, Neil Postman. Here's his uh, obituary, and we could add that in right here. If you just drop it below his name, it automatically becomes uh, a sub-thought. And when doing New York Times, you want to go over here and probably clean up your title. Otherwise, you'll just have articles that say New York Times everywhere, and that does not help you find anything. So you paste in the title. All right. So now you've seen a couple different applications. Let's go, let's go back to those Wikipedia pages. Technopoly is a book that he wrote. So I'm going to drag that. I'll put it here. And his Wikipedia, yep, it did come up with the title. And I also want to drop in his Amusing Ourselves to Death book. And technically, Amusing Ourselves to Death came before Technopoly. So it would have an influence that it's a, a causality that comes afterwards, not something that precedes it. And then he wrote a book called The Ed of Education. Let's drop that over here. And that would have been uh, after Technopoly and also after Amusing Ourselves to Death, right? So now you can see the flow of his work a little bit. And uh, let's see, where did he go to school, right? Uh, Columbia Teachers College was back here on his wiki. That's the one we would find most influential out of the places he went of note. Now, you could also put in, it depends on what type of research you're doing. Where's Teachers College? There it is. Now, if I didn't know what Columbia's Teachers College was, I would go and read the Wikipedia page and enter it into the model, which I've done. So for all these different pieces I've put in, with the exception of uh, books that I already have, like Amusing Ourselves to Death, I, I'm not going to read that wiki as seriously because I have the book and I understand and that sort of thing. But Columbia Teachers College, I would have to go and say, uh, what is that? And what is Columbia University? And, you know, what else does it have? Uh, what else does it do? Who else is famous from there that I might need to know about? Oh, Technocracy Inc. in 1932 was started by Columbia University that led to the Common Core Standards Initiative, a whole bunch of uh, things that go on today, including Technopoly. Do we have Technopoly here? Maybe I should add that. It's not in here yet. We just put Technopoly in here a few seconds ago. But now I see a place where uh, people might want to check that out because it is related to the technocracy idea also developed Columbia University. Now down here, we got some buttons. So when you're clicking around and you're getting into different areas, you might want to go back. So the easy way is just to hit one of these buttons. And these are pins up here. So we could click on critical thinking being removed from schooling. And it would take you to that part of the model. You could click on smart grid technology, right? So these are all shortcuts to various uh, inroads into the same model, right? You want to learn about eugenics and population control, you can click that pin. 
but you could also just get back to where you were with Neil Postman by clicking right here. Keeps a little history right there. So uh, now we have a little bit better idea. Uh, he's an American author. Do we need to put that? We could put America in here. Is America in here? Hmm. Seems like a broad topic, America. Hmm. What do I, what are we going to call it? America. America. No, that's not what we're going to put in here. Let's see. United States. Citizen. <laughs> All right. So maybe we know he's in the United States. That's not the easiest one to do, to be specific during a live show to provide value to. Let's get back to the, 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 the work here. Um, he wrote for a whole bunch of different places. So New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic Monthly. Uh, I'm not going to sit and put all these in here right now, but let's see. Atlantic. Nope. How about if I spell it right? Atlantic Monthly, I would have to add in. So the way I would do that is like this. The Atlantic Monthly. I would open it in a new tab. I would drag it in over here. When you drag it in, it's going to go below him. Uh, you wait for it to fill in with the title, and then you just reorganize it because he is not influential on the Atlantic. The Atlantic was influential on him as an employer. And now we have to do this. What's this? I don't know what this is. What is this? The Atlantic is an American magazine, a multi-platform publisher. It was founded in 1857 in Boston, Massachusetts as the Atlantic Monthly. So it goes through. Uh, commentary on the abolition of slavery, education, other major issues, and contemporary political affairs. Its founders included Francis H. Underwood. Is that the guy from House of Cards? And prominent writers like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and John Greenleaf Whittier. James Russell Lowell was its first editor. All right, so now we've got a magazine. Who owns it today? Because that's a question. Company, Emerson Collective. Let's see if that's still accurate. So we'll read down a little bit. Oh, the Cabots. The Cabots are involved with this. That's interesting, Mr. Cabot. All right, so that's a whole tangent right there. We can get into who are the Cabots, who are the Lowells, and uh, who speaks highly of them. Uh, let's see. An imprint of Grove Atlantic, not related. Let's see. Is Grove Atlantic in here, though? Harper's. Until recent decades, the Atlantic was known distinctly, distinctively uh, New England literary magazine as opposed to Harper's and later New Yorker, both published in New York City. So it's a New England literary magazine. So I think uh, it does because of the Boston Brahmin's influence on our culture. Uh, we should probably add the Atlantic in here and we could do that as a separate episode. But now Postman, this was one of the places he worked. So now if you still want to understand Postman, we have to go through all these other places that he wrote for. And if you don't know about them, you would need to put them into your model. This is relevant to understanding what, why he's writing what he's writing. He had been exposed to something that caused him to express these ideas in Technopoly and the end of education. All right, so getting down to uh, the books that we're going to talk about. Technophiles. That was an interesting word that he used in this description. We're going to have to enter that in because it's something he's talking about. Uh, technophilia from the Greek means beloved dear friend mixed with the art, craft, or skill. Techni and philos. Refers generally to a strong enthusiasm for technology, especially new technologies such as personal computers, the internet, and mobile phones, and home cinema. Even those terms all sound like they're from 20 years ago, right? The term is used in sociology to examine individuals' interactions in society and is contrasted with technophobia. On a psychodynamic level, techn technophilia generates the expression of its opposite, Technophobia, technophilia, and technophobia are the two extremes of the relationship between technology and society. Technological society. I was going to say, isn't that a book by Jacques Ellul? Almost. Technophiles do not have a fear of the effects of technological advancements on society as do technophobes. Well, 
All right, so that's an interesting difference. Technological determinism is the theory that human humanity has little power to resist the influence that technology has on society. Wow. All right, so this is a concept. It's a philosophical concept. We're going to add it into the model over here. It's going to show up below Postman. We must immediately correct that. And now we're going to go to that part. Now, it's a Greek word. It comes from ancient Greece. So let's go with that. Uh, whoa, whoa. Keyboard snafu. Greece. Ancient Greece. All right. Now we're getting to something. Techni. Do we have techni in here? Techni. All right. Now, this is a type of philosophy. Don't look at the keyboard while you try to type philosophy. And technophilia. Uh, well, what else do we know that uh, has to do with technology and people really being interested in using that and in information to control human beings? Let's do uh, cybernetics. Now, that's a hypothesis. Let's search this page, technophilia, uh, and we're searching for any cybernetics here? No? Technological ut utopia. That's as close as we get. But it does give us the connection that is hypothesized. It exists in evidence, and so the hypothesis could be verified, but it's not how you do science. That's not science. Science would be saying, Technophiles may view technology's interaction with science as creating a utopia or otherwise and a strong, indescribable, futuristic feeling. Quote, in the utopian stories, technologies are seen as natural societal, societal developments, improvements to daily life, or as forces that will transform reality for the better. Dystopian reactions emphasize fears of losing control becoming dependent, and being unable to stop change, end quote. Both utopian and dystopian streams are weaved in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, 8, 1932, and George Orwell's 1984, written in 1949. So that's interesting that those two well-known books about the scientific future are bookends on this whole process of rapidly adopting technologies that we don't understand and we don't understand what we're losing by adopting them, but we're doing it anyway. And that's not the philosophy of, of reasonable people who are, are looking for balance in these decisions. They're the decisions of technophiles. That's what we just learned about. People who want to rapidly adopt information and the use of technology, not to help embolden themselves, but to control other human beings, which is not freedom. So it's one thing to embrace all this new technology that you see coming in around you, but you're on a way, you're, you're like many, many layers down. Like the cell phones we're using, it's all developed with military technology once upon a time. Like all the problems, the, the microprocessor, the camera, the screen, the battery, all that stuff wasn't designed for the benefit of community of com, of uh, consumers. It was been, it's uh, driven by the the war economy, the rapid implementation of new technologies to harness and kill other people from the top down, not being created by the individuals. So that's part of it. All right. So see also. All right, so we got the technophilia directly from Neil Postman's Wikipedia page. But when we get to the bottom of this, right before the references, it, see, it says, see also technocracy, technological determinism, technophobia, and transhumanism. That's an interesting concept. So these are all concepts surrounding the work of Neil Postman and his book, Technopoly. So to understand what he's going to say in Technopoly next Wednesday, uh, those quotes, we have to learn a little bit about maybe transhumanism. Let's open that in a new tab. And let's look at uh, technocracy. We should open that in a tab. And technological. So you would do that for all of these if you're not familiar with them. Now, I know some of these are already in the model, so we can jump ahead a few steps and show you what they look like uh, when they're fleshed out. Let me just close some of these extra, extra tabs.
technophilia. There we go. So transhumanism. Transhumanism is an international philosophical movement that advocates for the transformation of the human condition by developing and making widely available sophisticated technologies to greatly enhance human intellect and physiology. Transhumanist thinkers study the potential benefits and dangers of emerging technologies that could overcome fundamental human limitations as well as the ethical big footnote there, limitations of using sex, such technologies. The most common transhumanist thesis is that human beings may eventually be able to transform themselves into different beings with abilities so greatly expanded from the current condition as to merit the label of post-human beings. Now, I, I would not do you a service if I did not read from the next paragraph because it ties into a whole bunch of stuff that's uh, also probably already in my blueprint. The contemporary meaning of the term transhumanism was foreshadowed by one of the first professors of futurology, FM 2030, who taught, quote, new concepts of the human, end quote, at the new school in the 1960s, when he began to identify people who adopt technologies, lifestyles, and worldviews transitional to post-humanity as transhuman. Now, that's interesting because uh, the new school, what is the new school? All right, so you would click that open. Now, before we go too far, let's go back. We've got, uh, we got the techni, but we did not enter technophilia into the model. So we're going to drag that over here. Oh, actually, it's already right there in the middle. Bah, bah, bah. Wah, wah. All right, so we have that in there. And we're going to go to transhumanism. Transhumanism is an adjacent, okay? Now, we might decide to upgrade or change this relationship later to a, a causal sequence or an influencer sequence. But right now, we'll just hook it up. Uh, transhumanism would be like that. See, there's two different ways you might search for it. So I always make that sort of note in the name. All right, there is a connection to cybernetics and transhumanism, technophilia. This is, uh, all right, so transhumanism. Let's see what we got hooked up there. Survey says, oh, Fabian socialism. That's interesting because that's the source of the new school, but I don't see the new school on here. Is the new school? No, we can make an improvement. We can make an improvement here. All right, so let's go back over here. Uh, it mentions the new school as the originating force. Let's go up here. The new school for social research. That's going to be over here. Scroll over because it starts with T, the new school. Let's see what we got cooking for that. All right, so the new school for social research. It's got connections to Columbia University and Fabian Socialism. So there's several times Columbia University has come up just in this line of, uh, of thought. There's uh, transhumanism, uh, there's technocracy connections, there's the influences of, uh, well, I don't want to get too deep into it. Some of these get into uh, some pretty deep lines of thought. Thorsten Veblen was involved in it. He was also the originator of the Council on Foreign Relations Foreign Affairs uh, magazine, which was originally uh, the Journal of Race Relations. Let's test my memory. Oh, maybe it was race development? Thorsten Veblen. All right, so Journal of Race Development turned into the Foreign Affairs Journal uh, for CFR. And all right, so now we're in the weeds. We're off to, we, we've connected into things that we already know about or things that uh, I've at least studied and connected together. And we'll go back to uh, transhumanism. We've taken care of that tab. You can flesh that out. The new school, let's see if we missed anything here. The New School is a private research university in New York City. It was founded in 1919 as the New School for Social Research with an original mission dedicated to the academic freedom and intellectual inquiry and a home for progressive thinkers. Since then, the school has grown to house five divisions within the university. Uh, they include school of design, liberal arts, social research, public engagement, performing arts, 
a whole bunch of other stuff. So now let's go down uh, to review where did it come from. Founding the New School for Social Research was founded by a group of university professors and intellectuals in 1919 as a modern, progressive, free-thinking school. Uh, let's see. Charles A. Beard, economist Thorsten Veblen, and James Harvey Robinson. Uh, so Charles Beard is a – yeah, several were former professors at Columbia University. Look at that. I got Beard in this map. Actually, he's right here. Charles Austin Beard. So now you're starting to see, oh, he's an Anglophile who's a Fabian socialist and a follower of Beatrice Webb. So now we start to see the trickle down. Anglophiles with Fabian socialist philosophy participate to create the next layer of abstraction, which is technology, technocracy, transhumanism, technophilia, um, these sort of things. So above the layer of technology. Now let's just go down here because I just caught this part here. The Graduate University uh, of Political Science was founded in 1933 as the university in exile for scholars who had been dismissed from teaching positions by the Italian fascists or had to flee Nazi Germany. The university in exile was initially founded by the director of the new school, Alvin Johnson, through financial contributions of Hiram Halley at the Rockefeller Foundation. So the Rockefeller Foundation, working with political theorists like Hannah Arendt, uh, the origins of totalitarianism is uh, her, her most well-known book, uh, and Leo Strauss, which is, uh, I, he's associated with the philosophy of neoconservatism that brought about the project for a new American century, uh, that was the PNAC document, these sort of things. So these are all very interesting characters that are interwoven with uh, oh, look, Marlon Brando went there. He said, I attended the new school for social research for only a year, but what a year it was. The school and New York itself had become a sanctuary for hundreds of extraordinary European Jews who had fled Germany and in other countries during, before and during World War II, and they were enriching the city's intellectual life with an intensity that has probably, prob probably never been equaled anywhere during a comparable period of time. Philosophical tradition. Uh, it stresses liberalism. It stresses the teaching of Parmenides, Aristotle, Leibniz, Spinoza, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Kierkegaard, Marx, Nietzsche, uh, Husserl, Heidegger, Arendt, uh, Freud, Benjamin, Wittgenstein, Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, <laughs> and many others. Uh, the critical theory of the Frankfurt School. Uh, that's Max Horkheimer and Walter Benjamin, Theodore Adorno, Herbert Mercusa, uh, Jürgen Habermas, at all exerts an especially strong influence on all divisions at the school. After the death of Hannah Arendt in 1975, the philosophy department revolved around the Weiner Schulman and Agnes Heller, and now boasts such noted philosophers as Richard J. Bernstein, Simon Critchley, and Alice Crary. Very interesting uh, adjacent information around this book, Technopoly. Uh, what else can we learn about the adjacent aspects? Do we have any more up? No. Technocracy. That was the last tab that we wanted to touch on. Let's see. Let's go back to Neil Postman because Technopoly. Uh, let's see. Technocracy comes from Columbia University in the 30s so it's going to be an influencer on technopoly and postman also is well familiar with columbia so that's not a stretch of a connection let's put technocracy study course columbia university or that was the 1932 it also has the course 1934 if i want to find something i can just put in the date 1934 then i'll find Technocracy study course. All right. So uh, let's see. I want to put the whole title of the book in there because technopoly is not a generic term. In this case, we're looking at an actual book. So let's put that in there. And then we're going to put by Neil Postman. So if we search for Postman, we would also find that book. All right. Now I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable about doing a smart reads. We have an idea of uh, the author, some surrounding context for the book. 
let's go over here to the side and say, do we know any books that might be similar to this? Um, hmm, Technocracy Rising? That'd be a good book. Patrick Wood. Oh, Patrick Wood. Technocracy Rising. I'm going to do a tricky thing. Let's enter multiple. How's this work? One more. They got some weird way of making you click multiples now. There we go. Then I hit. No. Come on now. Do I just click off it and hit enter? Let's see. Nope. What is this? How do I make it go? Updates to the brain. They should come with a tutorial. All right, so I'll do them one at a time. <laughs> uh, technocracy rising interview on YouTube. So people who don't want to get the book to understand what the relationship is, you could just watch the interview on YouTube. Technocracy presentation by Patrick Wood. Although, don't I also... I thought I would have had my technocracy rising interview with Patrick Wood. Let's see. Shameless plug. Nope, that's not mine. We'll do this one. Caravan to Midnight, John B. Wells. He does good work. So uh, we're going to talk about this next week. You've watched everything you want to learn on Neil Postman. You got YouTube and we'll add some of those too. But you want to say, oh, there's a book that's adjacent to it that you're familiar with. Why would you want to buy it? So you can watch this interview. It's right here. You hit play. Right? I take all the excuses away. Right? It just goes. This makes it all work. And now in this interview, all these topics are talked about by Patrick Wood. So there's a scroll over here. Grab the scroll bar. Right? Scientific dictatorship, scientific management, scientism, smart grid technology, technocracy, study course, technocracy, 1932. Uh, United Nations, Brzezinski. So these are all talked about in this interview. So when I watched it, I was like, oh, everything he's talking about, I pretty much have. And that was easy for me to do. So that's one of the things that I would add in there. So now we're going to go back to Postman and we can do the same thing uh, for this book. So does he have a Technopoly interview on YouTube? Let's ask that question and we'll ask the internet. And it'll report back to us. Let's see. He did a book TV interview. Author of tech. So before I bought the book, let's say, uh, let's get rid of this. Before you buy the book, let's say maybe you want to learn about it. What's his theory? What's, it, what's going on? So drop it in here. You connect it over here. Oh, there we go. Drag it to the side. So now you got book TV. And who's in that? Neil Postman. So if you want to know about Postman, now here's that video you watched. Here's the pages you read. You see how it's starting to hold all the information that you look up, all the questions. So all the questions you ask, all the answers you find, now you're putting them someplace with intention and you're creating relationships in the model, but you're also building synapses in your brain. So your brain likes to do this. So as you start to ask and answer questions and give it a form and format to do that, I've spent time modeling, like uh, putting all this stuff together and, and reading pages and clicking and opening tabs and, and putting them in, into relationships in the model and been thirsty for like an hour and not wanted to take my hands off the keyboard or the mouse to take a drink. And most of the time, if you're doing that video games, Netflix, these other things, it's like, oh, it's an addiction. But no, your brain actually likes to do this and it's behind. It knows it's like you're being given tools now and, and, and a way to put it together for yourself. And it's not to communicate the model is the answers to somebody else. You can't give this model to somebody else and say, here's all the research and all the time and energy I put into asking, a question, answering, asking and answering the questions. And it just turns out to like be a magic pill for you. It's a guideline. Here's what's been mapped out. At, like if there's a relationship, there's something there. So go read the page and find it and make that understanding for yourself. To try to do that in a linear format in a book would just be silly. It's, it's way too long. So the natural part of learning that people actually have to do and exercise and practice every day is not easily encapsulated. Even in this learning exercise, you see I have to like 
continue to, I would just be still on a wiki, the first Wikipedia page draining that. And that would be too long, too boring. So I want to show you parts of what I do, but not show you like the actual real time aspect is like, here are the things you can do to build out uh, subject knowledge on any topic. It doesn't have to be a human being. It doesn't have to be something historical like I'm doing. It could be your vacation. And you're going to where and where are the tickets and what's the links and what's the confirmation number. Like you could put that all and have that certainty and have that accessible on your phone or internet or whatever. But the important things in life that we want to formulate a strong understanding about, be able to reference that later and be able to share that with other people. This is a, a process that, that works uh, pretty well. Uh, at this point, if you guys want to chime in with questions, comments, things you think I should add to the model, um, do we need more data about where he came from, who his parents were, like what's relevant to understanding the, the gravity of his book and the message of how we use technology on society so that when we do the smart reads next week in the other studio, we can really drain the value out of this. And then at some point in the future, we'll get to a book like this. This, this is a real sleeper here, <laughs> Marshall McLuhan. But he also wrote a book on the classical trivium. So as we get into like uh, they, them, those who are easily named, they've left us a lot of notes on what their intentions were and why they wanted to influence human beings in a way that's not so freedom oriented, but is very much in favor of technophile philosophy. <laughs> ah, was that Cameron? I heard the, the joyous laughter in the background. I'm sorry, I'm listening on my phone. Don't know how I came off mute. <laughs> nah, that's yeah. all right. All right. I, I enjoyed the uh, the interlude. It gave me a, a chance to turn around, hit the button, take a sip. Richard, this is Heather Marie. Hi, Heather Marie. <laughs> How are you? I'm excellent. Um, I have a question. Why do you, th th that's pretty scary what you just shared. A lot of that stuff sounds evil. And I'm wondering, why do you think they disclose in such detail if... Like, if you want to do something evil, most likely you will hide it. I wonder why, is that arrogance on their part, or why do they disclose in such detail? They need to enlist others, recruit others, because time moves on. So they want to have a, a recruiting philosophy. They want to directly work with each other to improve what they're doing. And they know that the people that they're talking about have been so dumbed down by the time that these people were writing these things. Like uh, Prussian education system starts in Germany in the early 1800s and it gets imported to America in the mid 1800s, really starts to take hold over about 50 years. And then by the time you get to the post-Civil War, early 1900s, most people are disconnected from the mechanisms and persons who actually are running the the world and putting the world into war several times and then creating an organization to prevent the world from ever going into war again. That's the United Nations, all the same group of people. And by the time they get to the point where it's the Warren Commission and Alan Dulles and he's like, the American people don't read. Like that's a paraphrase, but I've actually looked up the reference in the book and it's like, yeah, he's, they're being arrogant. They know people like, even if we were to read this and know that we don't have the platform, we don't have the, the 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 megaphone that they have to be able to like project public opinion right for us to try to dissolve it with the fact it's like uh, you know a bb gun against a tank so that's not the strategy like uh like we can yell as as loud as we want about some of these things that's not going to get people to hear it so i think it's about actually digging in showing step by step how these things start to fit together and in highlighting the books that have been written before we got here. It's like, this was when I graduated high school in 1992 that he's writing this book. And so the function of the last 20 years is very much, or actually the last 30 years at this point is very much uh, come true. Like what they're pointing to. The other book that I have on hyper learning um, is from 1991. And it talks about how the internet is going to be this place where it's going to destroy the traditional schooling model because nobody's going to want to go sit in a room when they can have access to the internet and have the world's knowledge and wisdom at their fingertips. So there's, uh, there's what's going on as far as plans to control human beings through technology. But on the flip side, people are so creative and innovative and so darn hard to control when they're thinking. 
And so they really just want to use technology to numb and dumb people down and, and take them out of the loop of actually trying to figure out who they are, where they are, where they want to go, and how they want to get there. Because everything else is kind of noise. It's a distraction. But technology is offering up to all those distractions like dense. It's dense out there these days. Hey, Richard, I got, I got something I'd like to add. Yeah, right on. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, in that book TV uh, interview, he mentions that, uh, you know, his kind of perspective is one in which uh, he would, you know, basically uh, describe it as the negative aspects, the things that uh, we're losing by technology versus the things we're gaining. And, uh, you know, just in that fact alone, I think, uh, you know, he's kind of an essential uh, piece for the, for the, uh, you know, the ruling class, I guess, to some degree, because, you know, them taking a uh, kind of the art of war kind of methodology to, uh, to what technology could represent, he's really kind of representing what are the weaknesses that may be able to be exploited. I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I think first off, he's a, he's like a necessary alternate voice, the devil's advocate and for lack of a better term and in, in uh, reference to the argument, there are so many people on the technophile side, so many people with huge budgets, so many aspects of governmental wealth that's being invested into the, all that sort of digital infrastructure. And so he just felt the need, I think to say, has anyone looked at the other side of this? Is there, is there any downside to uh, rapidly adopting all this technology that, that we don't understand for ourselves, right? If you want to see folly, give a man some power tools that he doesn't know how to use and let him try to use them without, uh, you know, reading the instructions. Unintended results may follow, right? If you haven't used it before and you don't know the form and function and how it actually, like, actually works without hurting you, there's going to be folly, right? So they're doing the same thing. They don't want people to know that they're participating in life, which has a lot of major decisions to be made, but we're just continuously adopting all sorts of new technology that give away like our, our personal privacy, which makes us surrender certain rights that are essential to freedom that we shouldn't have to surrender. And they couldn't get you to surrender if they wanted to like convince you. But the beauty is they've got you to pay a thousand bucks every year for a new iPhone to do like this and get on Facebook. Like no one's held a gun to your head and made you get on Facebook, right? Or use Google as your search engine. We just all did stuff like that because it's like, oh, it's the thing to do. It's the easiest thing, right? Easy, the easy button. That's why I'm like, oh, get rid of the easy button. Smash that shit. We don't need it sometimes it's worth another five, five steps, right? If you're going to preserve your rights, maybe take a couple extra steps. I mean, I heard students yesterday in one of the boardrooms and they were talking about there's a need for uh, a social media network, a platform that preserves your personal data and privacy and stuff like that. And uh, we had a colleague who it was like 10 or 11 years ago. That was his whole pitch. He was like, Hey, Facebook's stealing your data, MySpace, these places are stealing your data. And it was like a subscription social media thing that would work just as well with higher uh, usability and all sorts of features because it's a paid platform without any of the data leak or without your private data being harvested and farmed. Right. But nobody wanted to fund that because <laughs> that's not where the market's mind was at. Right. And people's like, Oh, it's a dumb idea. People just use Facebook. No one cares people are going to start to care. And as they roll out this new Facebook thing, uh, this is relevant to Technopoly. As they roll out this new Facebook, whatever that gizmo is in the kitchen that like turns and watches you and, and follows you, like the future that, that follows from that is not good. It's a bunch of submissive, subservient people who don't know anything about freedom and can be easily manipulated and capitulated to whatever the technophiles, the technocrats, the technopolists want to roll out. And if you read Brave New World or 1984, neither one of those are good scenarios. <laughs> one's, one's a utopia. First off, utopia means nowhere. It doesn't exist, can't exist in reality. Like the Greeks had accurate names and they had a sense of humor for these things. Utopia means nowhere. So people who are going after utopian ideas, uh-uh, didn't work out so well in all the tests that have gone on. The same thing for dystopia. It doesn't need to go that way, but somehow along the way, People once upon a time, they saw a Terminator and these other techno, uh, these dystopian techno, uh, scientific, uh, science fiction movies, 
and they took them as business plans. Like there's basically a Skynet now. They're creating AI to the point where they're, you know, they have to shut it down because it gets out of control. Both Google and Facebook have had projects where they have like this artificial intelligence thing and it gets out of hand and they have to like basically chop its head off, right? So why are they doing that? Because they can. They're not a really good need on the basis of their customers, right? Unless their customers are really those companies and the food for those customers is really the users, right? How did he refer to the users? Basically like they're stupid cattle. I think he used a particularly more colorful phrase when he said it though. Uh, that's Zuckerberg. So any other questions, comments um, um, on either the content or how I uh, distributed it in the model and memorialized it for use by others in the future? A practical question. <laughs> how how long does it take you from thinking about the research to actually doing it? Do you have to set aside like a couple of hours or days or how do you go about doing that in terms of time? All right. So uh, before I became a dad, it would be something I could do spontaneously as necessary. So um, some news story might come out. I want to put that article in the, in the model because I already have that topic or I want to create that topic based on that article. That could take a while. And if I'm getting into that topic for the first time and there's a lot I don't know about it, that could take days, that could take weeks, but then you move on to other topics. So what you find is there's a lot of interconnectivity because in order to read one article, you have to know what the words mean in the article. And to do that, sometimes you have to click open and read definitions or read other entries for other uh, people, places, things, events that go on in history. And this is where I mean that like real learning is not linear. How we are taught in school is very linear chapter by chapter. And there's a quiz at the end before the quiz that has the questions it's all declarative sentences when you should get the, you know, learning is asking the questions and then the declarative sentences come at the end. The way we're taught is literally backwards. So there's that. But the other part where I mean, it's not linear is that just reading through uh, Neil Postman's Wikipedia page, there's all these other parts that I either know about or don't know about, but I would need to put into the model. So, uh, the nonlinear part is, well, I don't know what Columbia Teachers College is. Let me go read about that and then come back to the topic. And then I get to a part where I don't know to read. I got to look up a definition. Now let's come back to that. So it's not very nonlinear, but the practical application of what you learn, putting it into action in life is linear. So learning itself is a nonlinear interactive process that kind of feeds back in on itself and self reinforces. And that's what I think is actually demonstrated from reading and then modeling something in the personal brain software. I think the process that actually goes on in the physicality, in the digitality, like moving the mouse to get it in there, is very similar to the process that actually goes on um, conceptually to, or, like, to internalize, to break it apart, to ask if you understand all the parts and then to put it back together. The input, processing, and output. Does that make sense, Adam Marie? Yes, yeah, thank you so much, yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. Who else has, yeah, what else, what else you got, Michael? Um, that interview that you did for uh, Jane Cor James uh, Corbett's uh, World War I series, you know, in which you described kind of the, uh, the Milner group and kind of the influence that uh, Cecil Rhodes had. Was, is, was that kind of your, your functioning in regard to learning about how that, all those interactions and, and uh, you know, things went together. And then that interview essentially are a result of all that learning. Well, I was looking to see if I had put it into the history blueprint yet. Because if I did, then it's easier to show you while I tell you, but now it's all freezing up. There's too many World War One entries in there. Um, World War One Conspiracy by James Corbett. All right, so let me cut back. And now I'll just make the brain full screen so you can see it in all of its glory. 
All right, so here you've got the video and we could just play that if we wanted to. So it's in the model, right? Uh, there's a guy named James Corbett. He does a lot of cool stuff. I have put some of these things into the model over the years, not nearly enough of them. One of the videos he produced in 2018, World War, World War I Conspiracy, which has, uh, I think, has several parts. I don't think I added the additional parts here yet. Uh, that could be something I could do, but we don't need to do that. You've already seen me do that. You know how to do that. These are the topics that are covered in that uh, first part. So Paris Peace Conference, Milner's Kindergarten. And the way that, uh, no, let me cut back to me. Doing it live. All right. So the way that that came about is for many years, I've been reading uh, the history of the Rhodes Roundtable Group as they gained power in South Africa through the Boer Wars and the creation of the British South African Company into South Africa, which became apartheid. Uh, had the first uses of concentration camps prior to like that's prior to Nazi Germany. The British were doing it in like 1898. So there's a whole lot of power being gained in the Southern hemisphere that was off a lot of people's radar in America. It's not taught about in American schools and these sort of things. So I was getting into that line of research and then I saw how much influence and overlap there was with the same people participating in the buildup and creation of world war one. And then I got several books on that topic and, um, Corbett had mentioned a couple years ago, I mean, this is how things percolate, right? So some of these cases, it takes years, but, the, you're doing research during that time. So he mentioned it. And I said, when you do that, uh, I've got several good books on it. And I gave him the, and I'm not saying that he didn't know about these books, but the ones I told him about were Lord Milner's second war. And then um, the hidden history of world war one by Jerry Doherty. And I forget who the co-author was actually, is it in, uh, is it in the model here? Let me see. Hidden History, World War One, And from there, having read those books and understood uh, the, the, the layout. So I understood the traditional understanding of World War I, which is uh, it's a conspiracy to start with. So even the official story of World War I is a, is a conspiracy. So I was familiar with the, the, you know, the official story. And then I understood this layer of supra-governmental influence that was held by uh, Milner's Roundtable, which were the acolytes of Cecil Rhodes. So the Anglophiles who were seeking to bring America back into the British Empire, and that was accomplished widely through World War I and solidified definitely in World War II. So when you see that the people behind the actions of uh, those two major wars had this heavy congruence with the last will and testament of Cecil Rhodes from 1902, and that they were all um, part and parcel of like these various working groups to bring about that uh, reuniting of America with uh, Great Britain. So basically, I've read the books, Corbett read the books, Corbett had a script. This is how you make a film. So you read books, you write a script from the script. He did some interviews from that. He has footage. He gives it to Brock West and a movie comes out the other end magically. It's pretty cool. So I had, I saw the script for each part like a couple days before the Skype call. So we would arrange a Skype call. He said, I'll send you the script. I read over the script. Um, I get to see the overall. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Because <laughs> I, I can see it in my head as I'm reading this. I'm like, this is going to be good. And then I have to figure out how can I add value to this, right? So there's spaces in there for the interviews. So you have some dialogue, some narration, um, maybe a hint of what the other person's going to be speaking about. But even I don't know until he asked me the question, then I'm just like, blah, 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 right? Like, here's my live stream of consciousness on that. And during that, I'm answering his question. I'm drawing from resources that I've read. I'm thinking about how it could tie into what other people who I know are the authors of the books that he's using that are in the, the film, because Jerry Doherty is an author and he's one of the people in the film. So um, there's a lot going on and you need to be totally present for that. I can't be distracted with thinking about what I'm going to do next or bringing in baggage from a last meeting that didn't go well or something like that, right? So it's about being able to show up with your game face on 
prepared to fall down and get up because it's never going to be perfect. The highest expectation is delivering value to his audience, whom I highly respect because I know they're very well educated because they're watching his stuff all the time, full time, right? So it's always a challenge for me to be able to step up and uh, to drain the value out of the research that I've done. But on the flip side, it, you know, the luck that I get is the preparation meeting that opportunity. So I meet the opportunity on time with a clear head, ready to add value. But I also do a massive amount of preparation months, uh, years ahead of time uh, by accumulating knowledge that's useful and understanding these critical turning points in, in human history that are widely misunderstood and rapidly being censored out of existence. So did that answer your question, Michael? Yeah, I think that, that certainly gives me a lot of uh, you know, understanding. I, I think, you know, one of the things that you said in regard to the, the brain model is the way that your brain functions in regard to, you know, kind of creating the synapses between the different information and the relationships between the information that kind of gives you the logical, uh, you know, the logical ties to the grammar that makes it all work together and, and allows you to understand it better. You know, I, uh, my background in construction kind of led me into a situation in which uh, I had to deal uh, uh, with a lot of kind of shadowy mafioso type figures and it kind of gave me an interest in mafia. And so I've read a lot of books on mafia. You know, I'm just reading the, the one uh, today in regard to uh, the outfit. It's a, you know, uh, the 30s and 40s mafia in Chicago and, and how it tied into like the to Kennedy's death and so forth. And, but, you know, I never realized how much uh, influence the mafia had on kind of the political figures and something like this brain model kind of ties in a lot of things, ties in a lot of things together, you know, because uh, most people, you know, you don't, you certainly don't hear about that kind of stuff in the, in the, you know, in the history books. But in my understanding from my own personal experience, then going back and seeing how it was done through kind of the relationship through, you know, what authors have written about, I can really kind of fill in those, those little areas where, the, you know, it's not necessarily totally explained in the text, but you kind of get the, the reality of what is going on, you know. Well, and the other aspect is the Chicago outfit when you said that, I was like, well, I probably have that in the model and I know a little bit about it because Sinatra had his connection with uh, Momo Giancana and they had this connection to Kennedy and uh, it was a branch of, I think, the Sicilian mafia that had moved off to Chicago and then uh, which bootlegger started it, I might have a, a fuzzy recollection on and maybe that's all I remember off the top of my head. However, I can go to my model and say, oh, I remember all these other points of studying in their relation to the Hollywood studios. So I have a higher degree of detail because I'm able to capture it over time than I'm usually able to recall off the top of my head. Now, my recollection is pretty good and it's pretty sharp, but it can't hold all the stuff that the software keeps right there for me. So it's like, oh, uh, yeah, he, there was this connection, Johnny Torrio, between these guys and Operation 40. So let me read the notes because there's uh, the wiki link for this, but there's also uh, the, the pasted note that I thought was the most relevant part maybe of the wiki page. It says, along with the voting allegations, the outfit, so, oh, voting allegations, the outfit involves uh, political uh, vote rigging. That's interesting. The outfit was involved in a central intelligence agency mafia collusion during Castro's overthrow of the Cuban government. In exchange for its help, the outfit was to be given access to its former casinos if it helped to overthrow Fidel Castro in Operation Mongoose or Operation Family Jewels. The outfit failed in that endeavor and faced increasing indictments under the administration of President JFK. The outfit is the subject of conspiracy theories regarding the JFK assassination and that of JFK's brother, Robert Kennedy, who was shot in the back of the head by a guy who was in front of him. I'm sorry. 
that part, that last part was ad lib. All right. So the Chicago outfit, they uh, participate in a variety of things, heroin trafficking, cocaine trafficking. But before they worked with the CIA, there was this thing called Operation Underworld, 1938, 1942. United States and UK bonded, like their intelligence agencies bonded with mafia. So when there's conspiracy theories, uh, it's because these people actually had business working relationships that continued. It was, they started under the guise of World War II. We got to work together. Let's help beat the Nazis. But it continued, ironically, after the wars stopped. And that's the part that goes unadvertised. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people uh, you know, should be uh, knowledgeable about. Uh, let me just quickly read the note on Operation Underworld, because this is always a, a fun thing to learn about. Operation Underworld was the United States government's code name for the cooperation of Italian and Jewish organized crime figures from 1942 to 1945 to counter... Axis spies and saboteurs along the United States' northeastern seaboard ports, avoid wartime labor union strikes, and limit theft by black marketeers of vital war supplies and equipment. Nevertheless, fears about possible sabotage, sabotage or disruption of the waterfront uh, led Commander Charles R. Haffenden of the United States Navy of Office of Naval Intelligence, ONA, ONI, Third Naval District in New York to set up a special security unit. He sought the help of Joseph Lanza, who ran the Fulton Fish Market, to get intelligence about the New York waterfront, control the labor unions, and identify possible refueling and resupply operations for German submarines with the help of the fishing industry along the Atlantic coast. To cover Lanza's activities, he was suggested to approach Charles Lucky Luciano, who was an important boss of the five families of New York. By, uh, maf- New York's mafia's crime families is how they, they word it. Lu- uh, Lu- Luciano agreed to cooperate with authorities in hopes of consideration for early release from prison. See how they make that work? They want your cooperation. They just put you in a cage, and all of a sudden, you're very cooperative, very easy to work with. Lucky Lou. All right, so... Uh, Operation Underworld spawns various uh, crime families that continue to this day, but also has a connection in here with Operation Gladio that picked up right after Operation Underworld left off. And what do they do? Uh, It's a type of black market, working with organized crime, conducting assassinations, rigging political outcomes, these sort of things that go on in the world where, you know, people actually look at what goes on. This is what tax dollars are used for right there. Uh, All right. So Chicago outfit that goes back to Michael. If you're reading that book, are you going to remember everything you read or maybe it's a good time to break out and start doing a model. And that's how you get started. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's what occurred to me when you're talking about using this, using this as a kind of a, a model to, you know, to increase your, my learning. Um, right off the bat because I was as I was reading the book I've been kind of like making notes and I, I am one in which uh, I do a lot of uh, note taking and uh, you know I think one of your uh, uh, lectures you'd said you know you used to uh, you know before you did your uh, your card thing you used to take a lot of jur- make a lot of journals well I've got a I've got a stack of journals and so I'm kind of uh, behind you in regard to uh, where I'm at, but uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely need to advance my uh, my routine to make it a lot faster. And I think for some people, like the easy thing, or maybe they're already using it, is something like Evernote. But Evernote to me is like a filing cabinet. Like I put stuff in there, and I don't really go there to reference it, but I know it's there if I ever need it. But it doesn't tell me the interconnections between the files in the filing cabinet. Whereas the history blueprint using the brain software does, it holds the attachments, it holds the interconnections, it holds the, basically the recallable synapses. So I might not know uh, what's the connection between Al Capone and the Chicago outfit, but I know there is a connection because I put it there intentionally. And if I need to, one of those two attachments will tell me what the relationship is between those two entities because that's my source material, right? Right. Now, other um, aspects of it, like you don't have to make your links like that. You can even right-click on these links and name them all and name what the relationship is. I find that in the flow of learning and understanding, 
that's a bit too tedious and is prohibitive from actually learning and continuing to maintain your momentum by going back and like trying to do extra notation. Um, so I don't find that useful. I did it in parts of the model where I wanted to show like this person funded this person with this transaction, this sort of thing. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's just one of the things I do in life. It's not the only thing. <laughs> yeah. Usefulness yeah, well, is the key, not perfection. But uh, man, really appreciate all the things that you're doing, Richard. I mean, it, it, this is just um, some really valuable stuff that uh, I think everybody can learn from. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for the kind words, Michael. Does anyone else in today's meeting uh, have something to offer, an observation, uh, a complaint, some way we can improve for uh, the next episode of this? I have a question for Michael. Go ahead, Heather Marie. Michael, are you in Mexico? Yeah, I'm in uh, Acapulco. Okay, so your interest, what you just said about the mafia, are you following what's happening in Bolivia? Uh, yeah, we, you know, actually, there's a couple people from the community that's uh, that's in, I think, Colombia at the moment, but they're kind of they're a little bit more involved. In, yeah, I, I, I know a little bit about what's going on down there. Because that will probably add up to what you were just saying, especially because this is the first time that I know of in history that a dictator resigned voluntarily. Yeah. And I believe he must be in Mexico as a political, yes. as, because the president sends one of his or an airplane to get him out. So, um, yeah, that will probably be one more thing for you to follow up because they said that he was the one that was coordinating the um, drug traffic in between in South America, specifically Bolivia and Venezuela. So that would be an interesting that to follow. Yeah, there's some interesting stuff going on. I don't know. In general, you know, the military, uh, all the military kind of uh, arms within each country has got a, a association with the U.S. military and certainly with the defense industry that that kind of, uh, you know, keep the, the politicians in, in line. And when the politician loses the consent of the military, usually that's the end of their career. But uh, uh, that's, that's a, it's a long story. <laughs> And obviously, that's what happened to, to the leader of Bolivia. I wasn't even aware of that. So uh, thanks for that question and thoughtful observation, Hedda Marie. And for the answer, Michael. <laughs> Some insights on where Bolivian dictators go after they're not deposed, they resign. I mean, that could be a positive influence of technology. Back in the days before people had so much interactivity and the ability to tw text and tweet and these sort of things. You didn't see those dictators resigning. So maybe there is a positive lining to that, but we'll see. We'll see. Maybe he resigned because there's a, a much better, newer puppet in place that's coming. It remains to be seen. Any other questions relevant to uh, technopoly, technocracy, technophiles, tech creep, transhumanism, these sort of concepts? Or if you guys... Uh, are all set with learning for this session. We can continue on. I know we have several other modules and meetings and presentations going on today, Wednesday. It's always a busy day. <laughs> all right, then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you all for attending this uh, first episode of History Connected. Some of you will be less bashful and come off mute next time. That's all right. This today is just getting started. I'm happy with having it slide in the schedule, but it still got done. We got through it without having any major tech hiccups. And I think a little bit of light editing will make this a, a very watchable learning experience for those uh, playing at home. And uh, for those of you attending, thank you for tuning in and not dropping out. I'll catch you guys later on Discord. I think uh, 7 o'clock tonight, NVC with Amanda Price. Also, a Zoom link will be in the class announcements. Talk to you later. Peace.